Hello everyone, welcome to WaterWise Tips for your garden and home. We're excited to have you join us. I'm Ann Shellman, the Master Gardener Coordinator for the UCCE Stanislaus County Master Gardeners. We are excited tonight to bring you this program and now I would like to introduce you to your speakers. Take it away, Denise and Tony. Hi, I'm Denise Tata Sabat, and with me is Donnie Nolan, and uh, we're both excited to be here. And so let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Our agenda, we're going to cover several things. One is how much water is there, where our water comes from, and how it's distributed. Climate change and its impact on drought. Ways we can, most important part of course, ways we can conserve water in our gardens and homes. So, before we discuss ways to conserve water, I think it is important that we discuss how much water do we really have. Right. So, let's go ahead and do the first question on the poll. And how much of Earth do you think is water? Twenty-five percent, fifty-two percent, seventy-one percent, or ninety-one percent. What's the answer? Okay, I'm going to end the polling now, and you should be able to see the results. Okay, we see that ninety-three percent is the correct answer and most of you got it right. Good job. Okay. Actually, the answer is 71%. 71, I thought that was 71, yeah, okay. Oh, sorry about that, sorry about that. 93% <laughs> is was incorrect, even though most people guessed it, sorry. Okay, I was sorry, you wanna read the question? Poll question number two. How much of Earth's water is usable fresh water for living things? Is it 21.4%, 12.3%, 5.2%, or 0.26%? We got quite a few people guessing, and I will go ahead and end the polling and share the results so you can read them. Oh, we got a tie. Mm -hmm. Point number two, 12.3, and the last one, 0.26. And the correct answer is 0.26, so 1%. There you go. Okay, so there's not a whole lot of water. And let's put a little bit more in perspective. First, let's call the blue planet, because as we've already said, 71, about 71% 71 of the planet is water. Of that water, 96 and a half in ocean salt water, with another 0.9 percent in saline water. Only about 0.26 percent is usable fresh water. Most of this fresh water is stored in ice cap glaciers, leaving level available for human use. Now this looks a little complicated. I'll simplify it in a moment. If you look at the first column here on the left, you can see that 96.5% of water exposed with another 0.9% saline water. What we're interested in is this little tiny blue band at the very top, the fresh water is a two and a half percent approximately. Now that two and a half percent it's being broken down into the second column in the middle. That two and a half percent is a combination of 6.7, percent glacier and ice cap, 30.1 percent ground water, and then finally the little tiny blue band on the top surface, other fresh water, 1.2 percent. Now that tiny little band. It's being broken down even further, that 1.2% surface other fresh water. Of that, about 69% is ice and permafrost. 
29.9%. Look what's about that. Okay, 20.9% is soil uh, lake. And then we have the other little band here at the very top is that 0.26% for all living things. Okay, next slide. That's a lot of numbers. Let's see if we can simplify this. Here is a bucket demonstration that might help for you put into perspective how earth water is broken down. This five gallon bucket here on the left represents all the water here on earth. Now, I have taken out two cups of water on the right side. This represents all the fresh water on our planet. Thus, what's left in that five gallon bucket on the left is all the salty ocean and saline water. Next slide. Now that two cups has been split into a half a cup on the left and one and a half cup on the right. Now, let's look at that one and a half cup on the left. That represents all the fresh water in the polar ice cap and glacier, which are unavailable for our use. And half a cup on the right includes fresh water in the underground aquifers, surface water, rivers, lakes, wetlands, canals, etc., and the water vapor of the year. Now, I've taken one drop from that one half cup and I put it on my hand. Out of that five gallon bucket, this one drop represents all the fresh water that is available to humans, plants, and animals. This fresh water is recycled via the water cycle, precipitation, evaporation, condensation. The amount of available fresh water to us will basically not change, just the basis. Questions? If you have any questions, go ahead and type your question in the Q&A. I don't see any questions. So if uh, people are thinking of them now, they can go ahead and write them when we go along. Are we ready to keep going? Okay. Oh. Okay. Where do you think most of California's water comes from? Snow melt and precipitation, which goes into rivers and flows into the ocean. Wells from water seeping into underground aquifers, stored in reservoirs and moved by rivers and canals, or lastly, all of the above. And all of the above, 91%. Congratulations. Yes, that is the correct answer. Oh, question number four. Who is the biggest freshwater user? Cities, agriculture, fish and plants, or humans in urban areas? And the answer is, if you go alphabetically, it is in fact agriculture. And most of you got that one correct, 79%. Okay, so let's we'll talk a little bit more about our sources of water. I'm using Santa Claus County as an example because this is where we are. But it's very similar to other areas of the state. So we get our water from Mount Lyell up in Yosemite National Park, which over there in the Colgan Meadows area. And the green, like the, the snow melt in the spring, it drains down into the river, into the San Pedro Dam and Reservoir. And then it was split into two at the La Grange Dam between the National Irrigation District Canal and Curlock Irrigation District Canal. 
Both these organizations provide water as well as electricity for those two districts. The MIT Canal goes to the Gaspar Reservoir and to the Rock Lake at this zone sources. And the rest of it goes down the Baldy River, which ultimately ends up in the North South San Joaquin River, the major river in California, which ultimately ends up in the ocean. So that gives you an idea of where our water comes from. On the average, 50% of our fresh water from rivers stays in the river for nature, with the other half being available for human use of that other half that can be used for human purposes, as we've already talked about, 80% is for agriculture for food in our table. 20% is for human use. This does not give us much available water for homes and gardens, but we must make most of every drop. Remember that one drop on my hand, that one drop, that's what we're talking about. That's what we have available to us. Climate change, as most of all, not all of you know, is impacting the entire world, including California's water sources, with extreme water events. Extreme precipitation variability, either too much or not enough, will be the norm in the future. We'll have periods where we have so called atmospheric rivers, storms, which can cause quite. And then we will also have droughts, which can lead to water shortages, wildfires. And both of these can pollute our water supply, further reducing our clean water sources. You can see the pictures here. Oh, I'm sorry, back up for just a second here. So you can see pictures here the Folsom Lake Dam from the lake on the left side. You see when the reservoir is full. And the right hand side, you see when it's empty. But this was taken back in 2014, but that's pretty much what it looks like right now, too. I can go ahead now. How is history? That's been one of drought. We had a five year drought, the most recent one in 2012, 2016, and the other droughts are listed there. In the 21st century, the earlier part, there were also dry conditions during the 1920s and 30s. The paleo climate record going back more than 1,000 years, so many significantly dry periods. When you look at this uh, graphic of the White and K3, you'll see Y6 band. Those are the good years, the wet years. And then you see the whole skinny band, those are the dry years. And then there's also a black area where uh, a star from the forest fire. So these rings show the variability in the amount of water. So drought is common here, so no stranger to it. To be in a recurring feature of our Mediterranean climate. Our students expect it to happen more frequently and with longer, more extreme duration due to climate change. It's not the picture of the late dot table that was just taken in May. So you can see there's not a lot of water there. Okay, so on April 21st, Governor Newsom declared drought in California. And this map was released April 29th, showing the areas of our state. The different tradition and the dark, dark brown is a sectional drought, the red is a stream drought. Now the map is a little bit different now. This is back in April, so now there's a lot more areas of brown and red, particularly in our area too. So, due to recurring regular drought, practicing water sustainability needs to be a part of California's way of life. There are many water conservation methods which we can incorporate into our daily lives in the garden at home. And you may already be familiar with many of these. Hopefully, you can learn about a couple more, or maybe you haven't been doing something lately, it might be a fourth bit. So, we're going to explore some. By the way, at the end of this talk, 
there will be resources which will be emailed to everyone. Questions, anybody? Uh, go ahead and type any questions in the Q&A box at the bottom. Haven't seen any yet, so we will go ahead and continue then. Okay, we got poll question number five. What are some of the methods you use to conserve water in your garden? Mark all that apply, multiple choice. Oh, we got the wrong one there, y'all, I think. Uh, something, something went wrong. So just, yep. um, it's the correct question. What are some of the methods you use to conserve water in your garden? Um, and then just skip the determinant tomatoes. I think that <laughs> somehow got stuck <laughs> in there from the last poll. So we got reduce eliminated lawn, replace sprinklers or drip irrigation, use compost, mulch, hydrozones, or collect rainwater. I hope I know we'll pick the first one. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very encouraging. Reduce eliminated lawn, right? 90%. Replace sprinkler, 70%. Use compost, 80. Hydrozones, 50. And collect rainwater, 20. Okay, very good. Okay, so Johnny, you want to take that now? Water-wise, ways, to topics, topics that we're going to continue to talk about. First one up will be lawns, irrigation, soil types, designing your landscape, recycling water, plants, what kind of plants we can plant that are drought tolerant, and what you can do in the home. On the right side there you see a picture of mulch and micro irrigation helps reduce watering. Let's start with the lawn. Of the amount of water that household uses, about 50% is used for outdoor irrigation. And of that 50% that's used for outdoor irrigation, lawns are the major source of garden water use. So let's try and reduce the amount of lawn if you can, or eliminate it altogether. Depending on what district you live in, there may be a rebate or a grant available for that. Warm season and cool season turf grasses are used in California. Whenever possible, using warm season turf can result in significant water savings compared to cool season grasses. And some examples of the warm season are Bermuda grass, St. Augustine grass, buffalo grass, and zoysia grass. And some of the cool seasons, Kentucky bluegrass, perennial ryegrass, and tall fescue. Lawn and water. Turf grasses can be irrigated at different levels. Optimum, the amount of water Oops, the amount of water needed for best growth and appearance. If you want that perfect looking lawn, it's optimal. Deficit, this provides sufficient water to maintain adequate appearance with less growth. This level can reduce irrigation water by at least 25% for optimum growth. And the last one, survival, growth and quality are reduced. Deficit watering produces less lush looking lawns, but are still green and healthy. Survival water watering, unfortunately, can result in the loss of your lawn. And I can just add, sometimes people forget that, um, you know, they stop watering their lawns to save water, but you got to think about too, if you have a tree in your landscape, that you don't want to lose, lawns are a lot easier to replace than trees. So if you decide to stop watering your lawn, make sure to find a way to give your um, landscape tree that water. 
watering your lawn. Water only is needed to maintain your grass. Walk on your grass. If grass springs up, it is healthy. Try reducing water time by a minute or two to see if it still continues to spring up. If you have run off your overwatering during periods of drought, your city or county may require you to only water once a week, as this was the case in Modesto in the 2012-2016 drought. Cutting grass to save water. Set more blades to three inches. This encourages deeper roots. Grass cycle by leaving some long clippings behind when mowing. A layer of approximately half an inch of thatch function as mulch, moderating the temperature of the soil, helping it retain moisture. Waterwise irrigation. Change sprayers to drip system whenever possible. Check water valves, sprinkler heads, sprayers, and hoses for leaks on a regular basis, repairing or replacing as needed. Adjust your watering according to the type of lawn, plants, and soil you have. More on soil types in a moment. Water early in the day or late in the evening when temperatures are cooler to reduce evaporation. Deep water plants, watering less often for longer periods. Water according to the season. Have a water timer with a rain sensor so garden isn't irrigated when it rains. Reduce water frequency during the cooler months or in winter time, just shut off your irrigation altogether. Okay, Denise. We did have a question come through, and Denise, I'm sorry, um, you were I muted you earlier because I heard some. I don't know if it was a vacuum cleaner or something. <laughs> so you'll have to unmute yourself. There you go. Okay. Um, okay. We have one question here. Is there any native fast growing over the ground plant to use instead of why? That's a good question. And you have any thoughts there? Uh, so. A lot of natives are not super fast growing enough to uh, compete as far as if you're trying to outcompete a lawn. Um, there are some different species of lawn that take less water that are warm season. Uh, and so if you go to a nursery or garden center, you can get a fescue mix that's for our area that will use less water. If you're looking for specific native plants, um, we can talk about a few a little later. I'll grab a, a handout when we get to the part where we talk about plants and we can talk about some possible um, things to substitute. It's just tricky to substitute something for a lawn depending on what you're trying to do. If you're still wanting to step on it or have your kids or your dogs on it, it may not function the same way. But let's save this for the plant questions. It's a great one. Are we ready to move on or did we get another one? I think I read that the St. Augustine grass is, is one of the best. I have heard of St. Augustine grass. I don't see it for sale very often, but I want to say someone around the corner from me has a lawn um, that's St. Augustine grass and it looks really good. Mm -hmm. Of course, Bermuda grass is a warm season grass. All right. Okay. Okay. We have another poll here. What type of soil do you have? Sandy soil, loamy, silky soil, clay soil, a mixture of these. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. 
Seems like a lot of people have clay soil, sandy soil. That's another one common here, and then mixture too. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's in my experience too. Know your soil type. Different soil types of different water holding capacity affecting how long and how often you should water. Sandy soil dries out quickly, so it requires frequent watering. Silty loamy drains fairly well, needs less water. Clay, as most people have, does not drain well and hold water for long periods. And a mixture, a combination of two types. Soil texture by feel. To determine your soil type, and we have a diagram there on the right side, top right, rub it out between your thumb and finger. Take a handful of soil and wet it and rub it out between your thumb and finger. Is it gritty and crumbly, smooth and slippery or sticky? Does it fall apart or does it hold together forming a thin strip or forms a strong ribbon, as in the bottom. Sandy soil feels gritty and crumbles in your hand. Silty loamy soil feels smooth and slippery and forms a thin strip. Clay soil feels sticky and forms a strong ribbon. Once you know your soil type, you can adjust your watering needs accordingly. Ways to conserve water in the garden. Using compost and mulch reduces water loss from evaporation. Instead of sidewalks, put in water permeable plants. Using decomposed granite favors with space in between. Water permeable plants allow water to go drain back into the soil and recharge underground aquifers instead of running off into the, on down the street. Eliminate urban drool, which is water runoff. Monitor your water system, adjusting water so it is facing your targeted plants. Avoid watering when it is raining. Sidewalks don't need water. All you're doing there is watering the weeds in the cracks. Design your landscape to catch runoff. Observe where your water goes when watering or during rainstorms. Plant in appropriate locations to capture runoff, particularly if on a slope. Use slopes, basins, swales to direct and capture water. The photo on the left, these rocks are at the base of a slope to capture runoff, which helps recharge aquifers and eliminates runoff. Swales are areas that channel water to absorb it and are beneficial in recharging groundwater. Usually, like this picture here, are gently sloped. Hydrozones. Grouping plants with similar water needs. This is an example of a yard with three zones, one, two, and three. The right plant for the right spot. Zone number one, infrequent, no water. Zone number two, occasional water. And zone number three, regular weekly water. Choose the right plant for the right spot. That is, if it's a shady group of appropriate plants, giving them the appropriate amount of water. Some plants that require sun, lots of sun and less water. Collecting water for the garden. Harvest rainwater from gutters during the wet winter season to use for later watering of your garden. This can be a simple barrel or garbage can with rain chain or something more technical with a pump. There's a note here, be sure to keep it covered to prevent mosquitoes from laying eggs. Or you see at the bottom right there, there's a bucket in a shower. 
while the water is warming up for your shower, catch that water for later use in your garden. Shower water is very good for your pot of plants. Recycle gray water to water garden. Gray water is gently used water from bathroom sinks, showers, tubs and washing machines, which has been diverted and captured to irrigate garden plants, including vegetable gardens, as long as it doesn't touch edible parts of the plants, which includes root vegetables. Systems can be simple or complicated. Local jurisdictions may have stricter guidelines than the state. Homeowners should contact their local jurisdiction for specific regulations. This is a schematic of a laundry landscape gray water system. And some California cities like Encinitas are requiring new homes to be built with gray water systems. So it's something that is coming down the line. Looks like we have another plant question or two. So uh, we'll be talking about that. But the easy answer to what happens to warm season grasses in the winter is they don't look so hot. So um, really one of the best grasses for our area is tall fescue. Because even though it's a cool weather grass, it tolerates the heat moderately. But unfortunately, uh, when it does get really, really hot, it may not look so great but it's, it's one of the better choices. All right, we ready to move on? Yep. A water wise garden. Choose water wise plants and trees that need little water when established. There are many to choose from. Here are a few of our favorites. Now for the fun part. Water-wise shrubs. We have plenty of Cianotus, California lilacs. See the Cianotus concha or valley violet. On the bottom there's a credit there. It is one of UC Davis Arboretum All-Stars one of their 100 all-stars, which means it performs excellent in California. And also see and notice Marie Simon, which is nice, large, bushy blooms, full of color, nice pinkish, creamy blooms. And on the right, we have sages, many sages. This is just one nice blue sage. Down on the bottom, the tie-on, the red berries, also known as Christmas berries or California holly. It's the official native plant of the city of Los Angeles. They had to pass an ordinance down there to prohibit people at Christmas time from picking the tie-on from public parks and anything that was not in their own yard. So it is, it is, it is well established in California. Little bit of trivia, when people came to California, they thought that that was Holly. So that's how Hollywood got its name. <laughs> Los it's, it, I guess it was probably more interesting than toy on wood. <laughs> <laughs> Water-wise flowering plants. Again, more sages. We've got a hummingbird sage and which is on the left, the red one, and over on your right, we got a bee's bliss, the blue one. Great pollinators, great, great for your yard. In the middle, we have a yarrow. I think we had somebody earlier on, I think it was Jean Jeannie, said that, uh, yeah, one of her favorite plants, or her uh, drought tolerant plants is a yarrow. This particular one, they're normally white, but anything that's colored, it's, it's, a, it's a cultivated, these are cultivated arrows. And down at the bottom, you got a margarita bob. And someone was saying, did you say, Anne, you had a margarita bob? All right. Tough, tidy plant, low growing, shades of blue all the way through purple. Just 
It really is electric looking when you see it in the garden. It's, it's kind of amazing. Oh, somebody wants to give uh, Margarita Bob. Yeah, you can. I'll come in on that. <laughs> Water wise ornamental grasses. Pink muley grass there, top left. There's a nice color, nice and colorful. It's called a, sometimes called a hair, pink hair grass. Bottom, middle of your screen, we have a deer grass. That's a native California grass. It used to be used in by native Californians to make baskets. And the top right, we got a purple needle grass which is again used for basket weaving, but it's also the California state grass, purple needle grass, all extremely drought tolerant. Water-wise trees, lots of trees to choose from. On the left there, we got a crepe myrtle, middle Chinese pistache, Top right, desert willow. You can see on that large, large showy flowers. Interesting thing about this, it, and the flowers right throughout the summertime from May through September, the hottest time of the year. Down the bottom on the left, you got a fruit as olive. You know, fruit as olive, or you can have an olive that uh, bears olives. Extremely drought tolerant. Been around for thousands and thousands of years. And then on the right, we have our native valley oak. Will grow all summer without a drop of water. In fact, they really do not like to be watered in the summertime and cause problems. Water wise vines. Top left, California pipe vine. It is the only plant that attracts swallow tail butterflies. And I know Anna's a program where we're trying to encourage swallow tail butterflies down in this area. And people uh, are. Yeah, the. Um, the Caterpillars that were on my vines, one of them made a chrysalis and I was checking it the other day and it has a hole in it. And so it's empty. So I don't know if somebody ate it or if it, I'm hoping it hatched, but I never did see it. So hopefully it's off somewhere living a good life. Something else to <laughs> Yeah, I think it did hatch, I'm hoping. On the right there, you got a lilac vine and the bottom violet trumpet vine. Lots of choices for your arbor or your trellis. Water-wise ground covers. Top left, we got lantana. Even though lantana is, is a tropical plant, it is extremely trout resistant. Bottom in the middle, Reaping germander, a low growing perennial. It forms a mat four to six inches tall. It will spread out two to three feet. As you can see from this picture, it complements your cacti or your succulents. And top right, we've got the Catney Easter. Easy to grow, it can be a shrub or a ground cover. Ah, yes, my favorite, cactus and succulents. Cactus and succulents, which a lot of people had on their trout list. Cactus and succulents are the ultimate low water plants. They aren't for everyone, but they have their own kind of dramatic beauty and can be tucked into sunny spots of your garden. Over on the left, top left, we got the aloe, the soap aloe. Is a great, not only does it produce some great flowers, but it's also can be a great ground cover. 
you just leave it on its own and it'll spread and it'll spread and it'll spread. And it's got a depth of color and requires practically no maintenance. Bottom left, we got a white stone crop that's growing under a Meyer lemon. And that just spreads too, keeps the weeds down. Once it gets established, it spreads out and the weeds can't infiltrate. You only know, find weeds on the outside. It requires little or no water. Whatever it gets, it gets from, from when the uh, lemon itself is watered. But has depth of great depth of green color. And now this picture was photo I said about three weeks ago. Right now it is blooming and it has a white, the white flowers that they come up about three or four inches above the, the uh, cover itself and are quite attractive. Dead center in the middle, you got quite a variety of cacti and succulents in the, right there, the first in the foreground, we have uh, Crassula tetragona, which is the miniature pine tree. And that just, you just plant one of those and it'll take off. It gets three, four, sometimes five foot high, multiple branches and gives a nice, a nice look and a nice dense cover. Behind that we have in the dead center is a South American pet, uh, petrocactus with a tiny, you can just see there is a little, uh, on the top of the San Pedro, there's a little flower. And then to the right of that is the golden torch, which produces spectacular, absolutely spectacular flowers. They last about 24 to 36 hours. And as the word torch or flashlight, it protrudes about eight or nine inches and opens up into this white, big white flower. Again, they started to bloom about well, they were blooming last week, so about a week or two after after this photo was taken. And behind that, we got some prickly cactus. On the left is the desert prickly cactus, or known as a tulip. And it's got a nice pink flower. And right in the middle, where you had the cursor there a second ago, is the Indian fig prickly pear which has that nice deep, deep purple fruit that you can use for cocktails, you can eat it. As long as you can get the, the seeds out of it, it, it actually is, it's, it's quite tasty. And, um, and what you can't see are the hedgehog cacti. They have been taken over by the aloe and, <laughs> and the miniature pine. But they are still there. You, you just can't see them. And then over on the right, this is probably my favorite. This has got to be my favorite. This is a water cup. I have this all over my yard, everywhere. And I started off with just one little plant. And it, it just spreads, grows like a tree. It goes left, right, comes forward. Doesn't need a whole lot. It can be neglected for years and it just, it just keeps spreading. And again, behind that, you have the miniature pine tree again, back in behind. But yeah, that's that, uh, that black, black rose it definitely is my, is my favorite. Okay, are there any questions? I do see a question about what is Modesto stand on gray water. You know, I actually don't know. I'm sure they have regulation on it because the state has regulation. Yeah, I think the best thing to say is that we uh, would encourage you to contact your local city to find out the regulations. Um, every city is different. Uh, we just mostly wanted to touch on gray water as an option. And, um, you know, you'll have to, unfortunately, you'll have to research that further so we don't have the information on all of it. But hopefully more and more cities are 
um, allowing folks to do that and have um, permit. I'm sure there's a permit process and, and rules and, and steps that you have to go through to make sure it's safe. Someone mentioned they need to keep their HOA happy. I get that. <laughs> I know someone that lives on one. There's always an issue. But uh, yeah, it can be hard if you're trying to keep your lawn green. A lot of times um, what will happen is uh, people will call the helpline and say, my lawn has been beautiful and green. And then all of a sudden it turned brown and I don't know why. But when they're saying that, it's all of a sudden the weather changed. And so it's gotten warmer. And then if your lawn wasn't getting enough water before, it's just gonna show um, the stress from you know, not receiving enough water. And so like um, we were talking about earlier, just watching how much water you use, checking your soil type, and then you know, step on your lawn and see if it's springing back up to make sure you, you are giving enough water. And of course you can always give us or another program a call. It looks like we're ready for a poll question. Okay, part seven. What are some of the methods you use to preserve water outside and in your home? Are all that apply? Why vehicles at car wash rather than the driveway? At water efficient dishwasher and or washing machine? At water efficient shower and or toilet? A five minute shower? Turn off the on and off and see that I'm saving or brushing teeth. Thank you. So I'm going to go with all of those. And then I'm going to make sure here. Looks like most people wash their car at the car wash and have water efficient dishwasher and or washing machine. And then number of people have new water efficient showers, toilets, or people need to work on taking five minute showers. Turn off the on and off if you get lost saving and brushing. So it looks like people are doing things that they're supposed to do. Okay, so let's review some of these things. Other ways to save water outdoors. Using a broom or blower to clean driveway and patio and sidewalk instead of using your hose. And then I think I mentioned washing your car a car washing facility for starting efficient water recyclers rather than your driveway. And um, the state does have a regulation about soaking water and going into the gutter and drain and stuff. So that's another reason why you should be washing the car in the driveway. And then doing laundry and showering, use it and average 196 gallons of water per day. It's a lot. So some simple ways to reduce the water in the home. Fix all your leaks, cleaning leaks. Install happy high efficiency toilets. Just to say 19 gallons per person per day. And in our home, we do the fifth level, set up now. It's brown, but wash it down. <laughs> yes, this is Denise's motto. This is not a part of the Master Gardener program, just a caveat. <laughs> so, uh, you know, some of you may not have these things yet, but you all know, as your toilet and so forth start wearing out and you need new ones. That's the time to replace them. Put air bearers on bathroom faucet or shower head. This can be used while it uses my 1.2 gallons per year. As we've already mentioned, take five minutes shower. Or do the shower on alternate days. So you may not want to do that during the hot summer. If taking a bath, just fill the tub halfway or less. This is say 12 gallons. A day. And then don't let the water run for the faucet. Turn it on and off if needed, particularly in washing hands, brushing teeth, and shaving. And that's a hard one to do. I've been doing it for years now, and it's second nature for me. But uh, it does take, you do have to think about it. It can be a process. 
and you sit in the laundry, running your dishwasher, and your washing machine is a full load home. And the kitchen, you say, well, I'm just a dishwasher. Great dishes whenever possible rather than rinsing. Again, I'm talking about don't let the faucet run because once you miss the dishes, turn it off and on as needed. And then with laundry, front loading washing machine is much more water efficient than the top loading one. Now, the city of Agasso provides rebates for, for quite a number of things. Drip irrigation, so if you convert existing overhead spray system drip irrigation or install a drip irrigation system in an existing garden bed, you can get a rebate. If you get rid of an old less efficient washer, hose washer, you can replace it for the new high efficiency clothes washer. You can replace old high water use toilet with high efficiency toilet. With your irrigation system, you can upgrade or purchase a new smart irrigation controller and a turf replacement program, replacing your grass with artificial polyethylene nylon turf products for any all time sprout over at my state product. So any of these things you can do. And if you live in other communities besides the Jasco, that's what your city or county to see if they get even. And just so there are a lot of ways we can incorporate water conservation to become normal practice in our daily lives in our garden, in our home, every drop counts. Remember how we seen the bucket demonstration? There was only that one little drop of water out of that five gallons at a four hour use in our homes and gardens. So anything you can use, everything counts. Here are some resources which will be emailed to you. Uh, I'll review them. Kennesaw County Master Garden Garden Publication on Water Wise Landscaping. Stay sustainable. Oops, back that again. Stay sustainable landscaping class PowerPoint. Water Wise Plant Information from the UC Dave and Arboretum All Stars. This is a great resource. They have amazing plants there, and they have done two research to determine which are the best water wise plants. The California Native Plant Society is also a great resource. Managing turf grass and stirring sprouts. That is through the UC Agriculture and Native Resources Catalog. It's a good resource regarding the grasses. And the state of California has its own website on drought tips. And then the rebate that we just talked about. Here's the link for that. And finally, just last week, UCAR, University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources, they uh, released research revealing the best low water plant from UC landscape plant irrigation research trials that we results from the last two years, 2018, 2020 foot trial. And we had about 10 plants that were found to be excellent low water plants. And they do new trials every two years. They're ongoing and uh, to become a new plant that are also water life. So that's a good resource also. And finally, I want we want to thank the following resources that helped us. The Gasoline Irrigation District, the Quality River Trust, United States Geology Service, the State of California Department of Water Resources, and of course, the UC AMR and Santa Claus County National Garden Publication. It's a thank you to thank all of them. So, are there any questions? 
before we move on to the Santa County Library. Oh, I can go ahead and do this part, Denise. So thanks for joining us. We still are going to hear from our librarian. If you are not already signed up for the Stanislaus Sprout, uh, make sure you let us know that you want to be. You should be already receiving it. Uh, but if not, you can always contact me. And we are on Facebook, Twitter, and recently on Instagram. So if you're on there, we hope you will find us. Our handle is the same everywhere, UCMG Stanislaus. And in about three months, you're going to receive an email from the statewide Master Gardener program asking you a couple questions about this class, which we hope you will remember three months later, and um, just telling us, you know, some of the water wise practices you've been doing. And now I would like to introduce Vicki Salinas, our reference librarian. So Vicki, you'll need to unmute yourself and then go ahead and I will move your slides for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so yes, my name is Vicki Salinas. I'm a reference librarian at the Modesto Library um, here in Stanislaus County uh, Library System. We have 13 libraries in our system. Um, so today I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the um, resources you can find, uh, digital resources you can find with um, our two services uh, that have eBooks and e-audiobooks available to you for free uh, using the Stanislaus County Library card. And if you don't have a card already, you can go onto our website that's listed here, uh, www.stanislauslibrary.org to apply. And you can actually get a digital library card um, number, which will allow you to access Hoopla. So Hoopla is an app that you can download on your, um, on your device, like your smartphone or tablet. You can also go to hoopladigital.com on your PC. And um, you'll register once using your library card number, your PIN, which is the last four digits of your phone, and it'll want you to create an email and a password. But then you can search for, um, with Hoopla, it actually has eBooks, audiobooks, and more, which include music, movies, TV shows. Um, but its strength really is in its eBooks and its um, e-audio, digital audiobooks. So um, when searching for this particular topic, the wider, water wise gardening. Um, I actually had to, to do a few different searches because it wasn't coming up under that subject exactly. So once I put in um, things like water smart gardening or water wise gardening, it actually gave me a topic under cl climatic. So that's why you see that there. But searching for terms and, um, and names will ultimately lead you to what you're gonna be looking for. Um, and so with Hoopla, you can download items instantaneously. Uh, you can hit borrow and then it'll, you can read it right away. And you have uh, available five free um, checkouts a month with that. I like Hoopla a lot. It's really easy to use. Here are some great books you guys might be interested in. Um, the Water Smart Gardening book here on your left and the Gardening with Less Water here on the right. So those are eBooks that are available on Hoopla. So I'd encourage you to try it out if you haven't already. Um, Cloud Library is another one of our digital um, eBooks and e-audio services. Uh, so with Cloud Library, it, it only contains eBooks and e-audio books, but it may have some items available to you that aren't available on Hoopla. Um, so Cloud Library is free to use. It's also an app that you can download on your smartphone or tablet um, or to your PC as well. Um, with Cloud Library, the items act very much like physical library books. So sometimes items are checked out and you'll have to put them on hold. Um, if they're not checked out, you can borrow them right away. Um, the nice thing with both Hoopla and Cloud Library is um, you'll never get fines. They, they do disappear after three weeks, but then you can check them out again if you do need to. Um, so one of the good books I found here on Cloud Library is Waterwise Plants for Sustainable Gardens. Um, and so Cloud Library also has digital audio if you're interested in that and all free using a library card. And then I did wanna mention a little bit um, about our summer reading challenge. So this year is a little bit different here at the library, of course, um, because of, of the restrictions we've had in place. Um, but our summer reading has uh, turned online to online completely. We used to have paper copies and, and reading logs in the past, but now it's online at Beanstack. 
And so um, on our website, you'll see um, this logo, Summer Reading Challenge 2021. All ages can register. Um, the children, you can log what you read to them, and then you can also log what, what you read yourself. It doesn't necessarily have to be a physical book, doesn't have to be a book from the library, but we just encourage reading of all type. And you can log your reading on Beanstack and earn prizes that way or enter uh, to win prizes. So there's some, some really good stuff for all ages. And this is sponsored by our Stanislaus County Library Foundation um, and our friends of the library. We're very grateful for them. And then I just wanted to um, make sure you knew uh, our website, which is stanislauslibrary.org, um, because a lot of change is happening now. We are fully open to the public. And um, ever since June 15th, uh, with the reduction of the state restrictions, um, masks are encouraged but not required when entering the library. Um, we're open to full maximum capacity. Um, the only libraries that still aren't at full capacity are going to be our Sherlock Library, which is going through a really nice renovation. We're estimating mid-August for opening there. Um, and our Denair Library, I believe, is still closed on the inside only because of the um, influx of customers they received since Sherlock's been closed. Um, and they're a very small library, so they're still doing curbside pickup. And I believe Keys is also closed on the inside. They're attached to a school, so they act very much um, like a school library. So um, they've been closed because of that, but they do curbside pickup as well. Um, I do wanna note that the Empire Library has moved. They have a new address on, um, I believe it's on what street, Yosemite. It's near the, the public pool in Empire now. So it's a brand new building, feel free to visit. You can find the address here on our website under the About Us tab. Um, so all the new changes happening um, are listed on our website. We do anticipate hours changing probably in August. So be on the lookout for that if you're a regular visitor to any one of our 13 libraries in the county. And if you, have, if you have any questions, I'll put our phone number in the chat and you can call the library for any questions you may have um, regarding books. We do other services too at the library. So feel free to get in touch with us. Excellent, thank you so much, Vicki. Yeah. I know, thank you. Um, yeah, not that long ago, I did the um, free, ask a librarian to help you choose some books. And so oh, yeah. they asked me a bunch of questions about what do you like to read? And I'm one of these people, I'm always reading these dry, like <laughs> factual books. And I was like, I need to break out of my, <laughs> my, you know, thing that I'm stuck in here. And so, um, yeah, I got recommended a book that I picked up the other day and I haven't started reading it. So now I need to log into Beanstack so I can you know, get credit for summer reading. <laughs> yeah, that's been pretty fun. Neat. Yeah. So do we have any other questions? Looks like, um, I don't see any. I think people are probably getting a little tired of Zoom calls, but you know, we had about 21 people on here and 17 are still hanging in there. So that's great. And uh, we hope that we provided a lot of great information for you. And um, we're happy that we can videotape these so that they can be watched again and again on Zoom, Rewound, all that good stuff. If you are ever curious about um, following along and you don't have the... Um, handout, I want to show you where you can go. Let's see here. Okay, come on, Zoom. Don't, don't play me like this. After all the time we've been together, you wouldn't think it would do that to me. Let's see here. Share the screen. It's still being like this. Come on. All right, hold on. Really, I really I'm going to show this to you. Okay, we're going to go to our Master Gardener homepage for Stanislaus County. And if you go to classes and workshops, 
you can see uh, announcements. And then if you want to follow along and you see an old video and you think, oh, I missed herb gardening, you can click on that, pull up your very own handout, print it out, and then follow along with the speaker. And also for those of you who are local that might be interested to know, we are opening up our um, program for 2022. So this announcement is going out in a couple days, but since you're on here, I will tell you early, we are uh, going to be taking applications for the 2022 training program. So uh, if you need more information about that, you can always let us know. Does anybody have any other questions? Bill says, all good, thanks to the panelists. Thank you, Bill. We don't have any other questions. We will uh, go ahead and sign off. But just remember, because it's summertime, um, you're gonna probably wanna wait on installing your brand new lawn or garden, wait till fall when it's a much better time to do that. Ask about low water use plants, do your research. You know, We're gonna send you all of this information so you can click on these different links and download publications and make your wish list for all the things that you wanna buy. So, all right. Thanks everyone and have a great night. Thank you to Denise and Johnny, our Master Gardener speakers and Vicki, our reference librarian. Until next time, bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, bye now. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Bye, See you bye, next guys. time. Thank bye you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.